Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Sech the Shabbos DAF Tzadi Dalid contains one Mishnah about three quarters of the way through the DAF. From the beginning of the DAF until then, we have three separate discussions. We have one about a living creature supporting its own weight. And uh, we'll have three opinions on that and three different cases of that. Then we'll have the discussion of Rabbi Shimon's opinion of Machasha in its Gufa, where you do something not for the correct reason. We'll try to define Rabbi Shimon's opinion. That'll bring us into a discussion of Kavar Brios, human d- dignity, and then we'll discuss minimum sizes for certain things. Then we'll have the Mishnah. The Mishnah talks about other malachos not carrying anymore, and the normal and the abnormal ways of doing them, and the Gemara will explain that for a while. So first of all, our first discussion involves the concept of which is that a living creature carries itself. It shifts its weight or it holds its weight in such a way that it actually supports some of its own weight. Therefore, we had seen in the Mishnah yesterday that even if you are carrying a living creature, you are not violating this advice of carrying by doing that, because it's carrying itself in a way. So now our Gemara will have three different levels of this, and that's, are we referring to a human that's being carried? An animal that's being carried? Or something tied up, human or animal, which is being carried? Those are the three levels. We'll see what the halachas in those three things are. We'll also have three opinions, which we'll try to see if they reconcile with each other. They're Rabban and Rabbi Nassim and Ben Seira. The first thing our Gemara wishes to do is to compare our Mishnah, which is referring to the carrying of a live human who was lying in a bed, to the situation of carrying an animal. So we are going to bring in another Mishnah, which has machlokas between Rabbi Nassim and the Rabban. The discussion over there is if you carry an animal or a bird, and both opinions agree that if the animal or the bird is already slaughtered, so it's not alive, it's carrying, that's for sure. The issue is, what if it is alive? So Rabbi Nassim says, you're not carrying, it's not us, because Chai and says, that's my living creature, carries itself. On the other hand, the Rabbanon say, no, you are carrying it, even though it's alive. So the Gemara says, well, that seems to say that those Rabbanon don't fit with our Mishnah. Our Mishnah says, if you carry a living person, it's not an Isser of carrying, but those Rabbanon say that it is, so the Gemara says it's not a problem. No, everybody agrees. The Rabbanon were only referring to an animal. In the case of an animal, the animal doesn't uh, hold its own weight because it wants to escape, and it is not happy being carried by you. Therefore, it shifts its weight in such a way to make itself heavier and harder for you to carry. So therefore, the Rabbanon disagree, and they say that the case of an animal, there is no rule that it's carrying itself. You are carrying it either way. But everybody agrees that a human, if you're carrying a human, he's carrying himself, and therefore there is no iser on that. Okay. Now the Gemara has a problem on this. And that is from another case. This is a slightly different halacha, but it's really the same thing. The halacha over here is, are you allowed to sell a horse to a guy? Or not. Now, why should that be a problem? Chazal said that you shouldn't sell any large animal to a guy, because if you sell to a guy, you may end up lending or renting one to a guy, and that would be a problem, because the animal may do work on Shabbos while you still own it, and it's forbidden for you to have your animal working on Shabbos. However, what about selling a horse? So here, we have a statement of Ben Pseret, who says you're allowed to sell a horse, because anyway, the malacha that a horse will do is not an Isidaraisa, even if a person were to do it. So you don't have to worry about selling a horse, because even if you'll rent or lend a horse to a guy and he'll use it, it won't be doing a malacha dairaisa. What malacha is a horse accustomed to doing? He carries people. People ride on him. So Bem Sarah says, carrying people is not usher. It's not usher midairaisa anyway, because the people carry themselves. Now, that fits very nicely. The problem is that Rabbi Eichanan comes along and says that this statement of Ben Pseira only fits with Rabbi Nassan. But you just told me that both Rabbi Nassan and the Rabbanan agree that carrying a person is not usher. So why should this only fit with Rabbi Nassan if you're saying that everybody agrees? So the Gemara answers, we're not talking about horses here that carry people, we're talking about horses here that carry animals. What type of horse 
carries an animal. The Gemara says there is a sport called falconry where you take your uh, birds out. You have birds of prey and you use them to catch other birds. Now you carry those birds on the back of a horse so they shouldn't get worn out before the hunt. Therefore, these birds, these horses do carry birds. That's a situation in which only Rabbi Nassim would say that you're allowed to sell such a horse to a guy. As a matter of fact, uh, Tosis explains that this extends to all horses because of the concern that you may use the horse to carry birds. And um, because the birds will not carry themselves because they are animals. And therefore, the Rabbanon will disagree about the Salacha, about uh, horses, because they're afraid that you're going to use it to carry birds, and birds don't carry themselves. The Gemara now shifts to discuss the third type of carrying a living creature, and that's someone who is tied up. And now, the Gemara says is that even Rabbi Nassim will agree that if they're tied up, they can't control their own weight and how they shift and how they lie, and therefore it is forbidden to carry them. Do, they do not carry any of their own weight because they are immobilized. Now, the Gemara has a cash on this. It's because uh, Persians wear a lot of layers of clothing, and they don't walk, they don't move. So they are completely wrapped up and immobilized. They should count as somebody who's tied up, and they don't control their own weight. Yet, you are allowed to sell a horse even to a Persian. At least that's what Ben Sarah says. And Rabbi Yochanan said that Ben Sarah fits with Rabbi Nassan, which means that even Rabbi Nassan, according to that, should agree that you're allowed to sell a horse to a Persian. But why should that be true? A Persian rides a horse like a tied up individual rides a horse, and he's not carrying himself. Therefore, the horse will be doing malacha on Shabbos. So you shouldn't be allowed to sell it. So Gemara answers that, uh, no, Persians are not quite tied up. Rabbi Nassan does agree that you cannot sell, you cannot ride, you cannot carry somebody who is uh, tied up. However, a Persian riding horse would not be an answer. He's not really tied up. He's just very haughty, and that's why he doesn't want to walk. But he's not totally immobilized, and the proof of this is that there was a certain incident where a Persian uh, got his king angry, and the king was after him, and he ran three parsais on foot. So they're obviously very mobile, and that doesn't seem to be the issue. Okay, we now re- refer back to the Mishnah, and we begin our next discussion, and this is about the concept of Melachah Shani Tzricha Leguv Earlier in the Masechta, it has come up a number of times, it is the Melachah between Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Huda about Melachah Shani Tzricha which means you're doing a Melachah, and you're intending to do that Melachah, but your purpose for doing it is not the way it was done in the uh, Mishkan. So we had seen in our Mishnah that if you carry a uh, mace, a corpse, out so that it's away from where you are, that doesn't count as malacha shetzich gufa of carrying. The proper manner of carrying is because you want to bring something from one place to another. Here, you just want to get rid of the dead body. You don't want to have it around. You don't want it to be metameyu. So that doesn't count as malacha shetzich gufa, and this would apply to the machlokis between Rabbi Huda and Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Huda would say that it's an iser daraisa, even though it's ain't tzich gufa, and Rabbi Shimon would say that it's not aser daraisa, because... It is in a trichel gufa. So we need to define it. What does it mean that it's trichel gufa, that it's needed for itself? That means that you need it, you need this action to happen because you want something that happens? Or is it that it is for the purpose of the object itself? These are the two issues the Gemara will consider, as well as considering that perhaps you need both of these two options. Now, the Gemara begins by saying that if you carry out a mace in order to bury it, so that doesn't count as trichel gufa, according to... Rabbi Shimon, because even though you're needing it, you you are doing an action for the sake of the thing you're carrying, you're carrying out the mace in order to bury it, that doesn't count as tzichol gufa, because it's not for you. You don't get anything out of it, you just want to get rid of it. You don't need it to be where it is. Now, the Gemara goes further, and says that Rav says that even if you carry a hoe in order to dig with it, or a sefer in order to read from it, that is also, uh, that is called tzichol gufa. That that is us. So even if Shimon would say so, the Gemara says, "What do you mean? What <laughs> what could be more tzrichel gufa than that? You're carrying it to use it for the purpose that you need it. You bring it from place to place because you need it to be in the other place. You want it there, and you intend to use it. What could? Why would I think this is not called tzrichel gufa? So the, the Gemara says because this is only being carried for your use. It's not being carried for its use. I may think that you, you need both together." 
You have to be carrying a hoe in order to fix it and then use it. And carrying a Sefer Torah in order to fix that and then use that. That way you're doing something for the purpose of the object and for your own purpose. You may think that that is the definition of Tzrich Lekuf according to B'Shemin, and I'm coming to teach you that that's not true. If you just want to use it for its stated proper purpose, that is called Tzrich Lekuf. Okay, now the Gemara has a, a related case which is on a different subject, and it teaches us the halacha of Kavod HaBrios, that you're allowed to violate certain halachas for the sake of maintaining human respect and dignity. And that's that there was a corpse, there was a mace that was lying in a Rishos in the city of Drakera. And the Gemara says, Nachman Bar Yitzchak said, you're allowed to carry it um, out of the Rishos into a Carmelis. Now, Muktza here wasn't the issue. Rashi explains they dealt with that the way we discussed earlier in the Masachto by using a loaf of bread on it or a child. But the issue is that you're carrying it out of Rishos So the Gemara says that Rav Yechnan, who was the bracha of Marbar Rabbona, Said, how are you allowed to do this? How are you allowed to do this? You allowed to carry it out? That means you're holding like Reb Shimon. Even if you're holding like Reb Shimon, it's Melachim and Tzricha to carry out a mace. That's only uh, that it's not Asud Araisa, it's still Asud Rabbanan. So the, the Gemara says he answered him and he said, How I like him? He said, By Hashem. Well, how can you even have a problem on. What I did, first of all, it has nothing to do with Rabbi Shimon. It's even Rabbi Yehuda. The problem, the issue here is not I was carrying it or allowing it to be carried to a Karmelis. That's only an Isidur Abbanon of carrying. It wasn't from Rosh Hashayach to a Rosh Hashayach. And second of all, there's Kavad Abriyus here. The body and the place that it was lying would be subject to spoilage, to decay because of the sun, to fire, all kinds of issues. I wanted to move it to a safe, protected place. That is not usr, even um, if it might be an isr. Dirabonon, because of Kavad Abrios, that's not an issue at all. The Gemara now goes, refers back to the Mishnah, and it's going to introduce a completely different subject, which will cycle back to the Mishnah, because we'll end up trying to bring a proof to the subject from our uh, Mishnah. What's the issue here? The issue is, what happens if you do an action with when you did it is not significant, or creates no Isser, but it sets up a scenario which later can trigger an Isser to happen. Are you responsible for that or not? What's the case? So the case is discussing the halachas of Tzaras. We know that the rule is you're not allowed to remove any signs of Tumah that are in a Tzaras. It says, Yishamar B'nai Gat Tzaras, and not allowed to cut off Tumah signs. The two examples which we have are if you have two white hairs in a nega, in an area of tzaras, so if you cut off the white hairs, or even if you cut off just one of the white hairs, you're taking away the tumma sign. Two white hairs is a sign of tumma. Also, if you cut off a piece of healthy skin, that's also a tumma sign, if there's healthy skin inside the nega. So if you cut that off, that's also removing the tumma sign that would be violating this iser. The first question is, what happens if you have three white hairs and you cut off one of them? So right now, there's no problem, because you still left the tumma sign behind, you still have two white hairs. But then later, if one of those other white hairs falls out, the fact that you previously removed a white hair now triggers the tumma sign to have disappeared. If you would have left your white hair behind, you would still have a tumma sign there. So is that considered to be an iser or not? So Rav Nachman says, yes, it's an iser. It's revealed later, it's triggered that what you did was an iser. And Rav says, no, at the time you did it, it's not a problem. Now, the Gemara is going to show that um, Rav Sheshes will try to prove from our Mishnah. Why? Our Mishnah discusses the minimum size for carrying. For carrying a mace, a piece of uh, a corpse or of a nevela. And our Mishnah says that you're only chayev, you're only violating anything if you carry an olive size, a kezais. If you carry less than that, it's not a problem. But there's another place, there's a price which says that if you carry half an olive size, it is a problem. So we have a contradiction. Is carrying half an olive size a problem or not? So Rosh Hashanah says that the answer to the contradiction must be as follows. Where is it a problem? It's a problem if you have exactly one kezayis and you carry away half of it. So it's a very significant thing that you did. You left behind only half an olive size. That's too small to transfer or receive tumma. If, however, you had an olive and a half size... So then the fact that you carried away half of it is not a problem because you left the kezayis behind. It's not too small now. Ah, but what do you mean? Maybe half of that olive is going to disappear later. And it'll be revealed that the fact that you took away half means that now it's too small. So it should be considered significant what you did. So the, the proof therefore is that if at the time that I did it, it was insignificant. There was an olive and a half size of nevela, And I took away half so that the remains 
a full olive size, even if it will later disappear and become smaller and my original action becomes significant, at this point it's not significant, and therefore you don't have to worry about it, you didn't violate anything. This proves, says Rav Sheshes, that if you do something and later it causes something, later something else happens which, which causes your action to become significant, halachically, it's not an issue. The same would be if you took away one white hair from three, and then later another one falls out, it's not a problem, because at the time that I took away my one hair, uh, it was no halachic significance, it didn't become muzzle. So the Gemara says, no, that's not necessarily proof. I will tell you that the case in which taking away an olive is not a problem, it's not where you have exactly one and a half olive size, and you take away half an olive, and then it's not a problem because maybe another half will fall away Anyway, the case is where you have a whole dead body. You have a whole novella. You take away half a kid's eyes. You don't have to worry that it's going that the rest of it is all going to vanish and leave half an olive behind. No, that's not a concern. They're carrying half an olive is not a problem. But I'm really right that if you, if you would have one and a half olive size and you took away half and then another half disappeared later, what you did is significant and you would be considered to be carrying because of that. Okay, now we get to the Mishnah, which leaves the halachas of carrying. We'll get back to it in the next uh, Mishnah. But here we are going to discuss the halachas of goizes and the toilish, which is cutting off uh, fur or wool from an animal. But here we'll be discussing pulling out hairs or cutting off nails. And the Gemara, the Mishnah, defines when it is considered normal and it's an us, and it's an iser deraisa, when it's done in an abnormal way and it's an iser derabonon. So first of all, the Gemara has a couple of cases here, and Rabbi Eliezer says that it's an iser deraisa, and the Chachamim said it's only an iser derabonon. What are the cases? So somebody who cuts off his fingernail with another fingernail, or he bites it off with his teeth, or somebody who pulls out hair with his fingers either from his head, from his mustache, or from his beard. And then we have a woman who braids her hair, or she puts makeup around her eyes, or she combs out her hair. In all these cases, Rabbi Elezer says, this is a Isa, and the Chacham says, this is a Darbana. The Gemara begins by figuring out exactly what the case of this Mechok is between the Chacham and Rabbi Eliezer is. There are three potential cases here. That is, if somebody is cutting somebody else's nails with his own fingers, or if somebody's cutting his own nails with his fingers. And the third case is if somebody's cutting his own nails with a nail clipper. Now the first case is the most far out. It's the most strange. And the most natural for it to be not an Isra Dereza. The middle case is the one our Mishnah discussed. Where he's, it's not so normal because he's using it, his fingers to cut his finger nails. And the last case is the most simple and the most obvious. That it should be Usr and Isra Dereza because it is, he's using a nail clipper. Clipper, which is normal. So the Gemara says that our Machlekes and our mission is only in the middle case, where he's cutting his own fingers, fingernails, and he's using his fingers. So the Gemara says that's obvious. That's exactly what our Mishnah says. It says if somebody cuts his own fingernails with his fingers, why would I think it was either of the other two cases? So the Gemara says, okay, as far as the case of using the nail clipper, we're over there, everybody agrees that it's an Isra right? so I may still think that the Rabbanon argue in that case. And they say that it's not us. Cutting your nails is not an Isser. The only Isser of Gaizes is shearing an animal's wool. Cutting your nails is not involved. I wanted them to discuss that case to tell you that even in the case, the middle case, which is more abnormal, there, Rabbi Elijah still says it's an Isser Dairaisa. Now, as far as the, the first case, where you're cutting somebody else's nails, is completely abnormal. The Gemara says, for sure, same issue. I can obviously see that that's not the case of the Machlokas, because the Mishnah said, where he's cutting his own nails. The Gemara said, no, I may still think there that Rebbe Lazar holds at your chayev anyway. He may, he may still say that that's normal. I, why didn't the Mishnah discuss that case? To tell you that even in the more normal case of Rebbe Lazar, uh, the more normal case where he's cutting his own nails with his fingers, that even there the Rabbanon say that it's an Isser the Rabbanon and not an Isser the Raisa. However, we've now cleared up that it's not true. The only case where there's a, a Machlokis is the middle case, where he's cutting his own nails with his own fingernails. And the more normal case is definitely Isser the Raisa, according to everybody, and the less normal case is definitely Isser only the Rabbanon, according to everybody. The Gemara now moves on to the next subject, which is what is the minimum size of hair cutting to be in violation of Isra Daraisa? The Gemara quotes a which has that it's the end of a pair of scissors full. 
And says, how much is that? Rabbi says, it's two hairs. And Rabbi says, but what do you mean? The Brisa later says is that pulling out hairs is a sir, and the minimum size for that is two hairs. So obviously, what would it, the size it said earlier is not the same, or just say it's the same size all at once. So the Gemara says, you meant to read it together, cutting hairs is a scissor full, and that's two hairs, just like pulling out hairs, which is two hairs. So we have a Brisa which spells this out. The Brisa said, if somebody cuts out a scissor full of hairs on Chavez, uh, he's violating the Isser. How much is that? It's two hairs. Um, Rabbi Eliezer says even less than that, even one hair. And the Chachamim agree that one hair could be a problem in some situations, and that's where you pull out white hair from amongst the black hairs. The reason for that is because uh, one white hair you care about very much, so it's significant and you're violating the Isser then. Now, actually, if you pull out a white hair from amongst the black hairs, that's also even during the week because it's the silbash. It's a man should not be doing women's cosmetic activities. Taking out white hairs is a cosmetic activity. Okay, now we go to the halacha of cutting nails. The Mishnah had mentioned that. And Shimon ben Elazar says that if your nail is mostly detached already, or if you have a piece of skin which is mostly detached already, so then Allah is as follows. If you take it off by hand, it's mutter. If you take it off with a clipper, it's asr. The one says, what? There isn't anything where if you take it off with a cleat, it's asr daireisa, which is what he said. And if you take it off by hand, it's completely mutter. It's got to be at least an isr darabonon. The Gemara says, no, really, this is the correct way to read the b'risa. We have three levels. If you have a nail or a piece of skin, which is majority detached, and you take it off with your fingers, that's mutter. If you take it off with a kli, that's an iser der abanon. But if it's not majority detached, then it's an iser der isa. The Gemara says, this is the halacha, like your Shimon ben Elazar. Now, the Gemara says, Rabbi Barachana says, but it's only if it's uh, hanging in a way that it is uncomfortable to you, it's peeling from the back, to the, from the end of the finger to the root. If it's peeling the other way, it's not uncomfortable, and therefore it's not usher. Okay, now, back to the Mishnah. We had seen the Isurim of braiding hair, combing hair, and putting makeup on the eyes. The Gemara wants to know what is the Isur in these different activities. So the Gemara says braiding hair is weaving. Um, putting makeup around the eye is writing. And combing the hair is spinning because you're making straight strands out of a mass. So the Gemara says, but these are all abnormal ways. This is It's not a normal way to write, it's not a normal way to spin, and it's not a normal way to weave. So the Gemara says a different explanation of what this is over here. The Gemara says makeup is a form of painting. You're painting the skin, and braiding or combing the hair is fixing, it's building. The Gemara says that's how you build Mar says yes, because when Hashem braided Chavos here in Gan Eden, it says Vayiven Hashem is Atzela. Hashem had built what he had taken, and the Medrash explains that he built means he braided her hair. Gemara explains because in the cities near the Yam, they use the term a building for. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.